Firstly, a quick run through of something about the organization that I work for and uh, our experience that we think uh, makes it potentially interesting for you to listen to what I'm going to say today. A little bit about the context um, drivers and trends that are um, moving forward the debate about sustainability. We are going to focus on this session a lot about solutions, but I think it's important to mention um, a little bit the context so that we understand where we're coming from and what we're trying to achieve. Then I'm going to share with you some information about the kinds of tools and particularly standards-based uh, sustainability tools. I know that for some people the word standards uh, um, sort of makes you clench your fists and get a little concerned based on this morning's uh, discussions, but I hope that after my talk you will realize that perhaps standards actually is a broad term that can have a range of uses and is not only linked to certification. Um, I'm going to focus on two or three examples of some of the work that we ProForest do that I think would be interesting to you in, in what you're trying to achieve. And one slide on some closing thoughts about some of the, the challenges that we're seeing emerging. So a little bit about ProForest. This is our mission. We are a mission-driven organization that's about supporting people, um, and it's about transforming natural resources production towards greater sustainability. We do that mainly in three ways, in particular broadly. We facilitate the development, the coming together of people to, to define policies and standards. And that's been a big part of the, the, what has taken us to work with many roundtables, many national standard settings schemes, many initiatives trying to define sustainability and then work out how to measure it or how to put policies in place. We accompany directly organizations, companies, supply chain actors, producers who want to make changes and implement responsibility, uh, responsible practices on the ground. And at the heart of what we do, we build capacity and offer training and uh, accompaniment to the different actors that we work with. We have quite a unique organization. We are both a consulting organization um, and we work through programs, which is where we um, support people in the longer term application and implementation of sustainability practices. We're a nonprofit group. And the way that we work along the whole of the supply chain means that we work in partnership with a whole range of actors, um, including all scales of producers and all actors along the supply chain. We have our strength in agricultural commodities and, and forest <coughs> products, so particular experiences around working with palm oil, soy, sugar, forest products, and cattle, uh, beef, and leather. But we have also applied our um, skills and experiences to other sectors like uh, cotton, and rubber, for example. We, as I mentioned, work all along the supply chain, production, manufacturing, processing, retailing, and also investment, which is an, an area that people forget quite often but can make a real difference to the way that uh, practices happen on the ground. And we've worked in over 40 countries, and we have offices in four regions of the world, including one here in, in Brasilia, in Brazil. <coughs> so that was a little bit about us. And so I'll be drawing on some of our experience with um, other commodities to perhaps help those people who are more directly working in um, sustainable livestock to maybe learn some lessons and think about how to apply things in the sustainability debate in this sector. So what about some trends? Well, setting the scene... We are seeing an increasing rise in the concern of consumers, not only concerns, but their awareness and interest in the topic of the sustainability um, of the things that they are consuming, not just food, but manufactured goods that often have agricultural products in them. We are seeing a related 
rise in industry commitments around what they're going to do about sustainability in their supply chains. As a result, everyone needs sustainability tools. How do you actually turn your commitment into something tangible and measure it? And we're also seeing um, changes in practices on the ground. Um, it may be that producers were already doing things sustainably and now they're using sustainability tools to be able to demonstrate that and communicate with their uh, buyers or an end consumer. But it may be that they've actually shifted their practices as a result of um, new information or a desire to, to change something. So a little bit more on those. Some of this will be familiar to a lot of you. But I think it's important to see how in some sectors the consumer interest and concern has turned into quite targeted campaigning. On the left, those two slides with the orangutans is concern about uh, habitat destruction in the palm oil producing regions. Top left, targeting a brand, and top uh, bottom left, targeting a chain of retailers, supermarkets. People demonstrating around about concerns uh, about the way soy is being grown, in particular in relation to pesticides and the impact on human health. Forest crime, that's campaigning around illegal logging. And in the middle, um, concern around the link between deforestation and uh, livestock production. And this is very up-to-date information that you may not be able to see at the back, but I'll, I'll draw out the highlights for you. So the left-hand graphic, both graphs come from National Geographic and Globe Scans collaboration uh, on a project called Green Dex. 2014 information. Left-hand graph is perceived environmental impact of producing different types of food. And I think what's interesting there, and perhaps a little surprising, especially given what I've just shown you in terms of campaigns, is that people, this is data from an average of 18 countries, and the top um, types of food that people associate with environmental impact are beef, pork, fish, poultry, lamb, dairy. So the livestock component and fisheries is much more associated with environmental impact than things like grains and uh, fruit. The other graph that I thought you might be interested in from the same source is what people said, a sample of people in different countries, in relation to whether they agree that it's very important to know how my food is produced. So the two blue lines are people saying they strongly agree or they agree that it's very important to know how my food is produced. What I find interesting about this graph is that some of the countries with the largest numbers of people talking about agreeing are in countries like Russia, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, South Africa, whereas I think we all have a perception that the only countries really interested in, uh, in some of these issues are somehow Europe and North America. And this, from 2014, suggests that actually that, that uh, assumption would be wrong. So raising a, rising awareness about how food is produced and its environmental impact. And then I thought um, you might like to see very briefly some examples. Some of you may be very familiar with these. Maybe for others it's new. These are some examples of current industry commitments around sustainability. Uh, we have Nestle talking about having by 2015 um, some achievements in relation to 12 different key commodities uh, in, with regard to their performance against Nestle's own responsible sourcing guidelines. We've got Unilever talking about sourcing 100% of agricultural raw materials sustainably by 2020. Hershey's, who are focusing on cocoa and saying that they'd like to have 100% of certified cocoa for all of their chocolate products all over the world, so not just for one market. And Cargill's recent, this is September 2014, 
the extension of their commitment they'd already made about palm oil to all commodities that they produce, um, that they will um, ensure zero deforestation. So what's interesting about this is whether you call it a policy, a plan, a strategy, or a commitment, you've often got a, um, a very clear time-bound target and an element of measurability of what you're trying to achieve. And there's been a huge proliferation of commitments around zero deforestation in the last six months to a year, um, sometimes commodity-specific, sometimes generic. And what this means is that the private sector needs tools to implement these commitments and needs a way to demonstrate both to themselves and to their stakeholders that this is happening. So this may be something that becomes very relevant if it isn't already for the cattle sector. So what I thought would be interesting perhaps for this audience would be to hear a little bit about ProForest's way of grouping sustainability tools that are in some way or another linked to sets of principles and criteria. And most of this information comes from a review that uh, ProForest did for GTPS earlier this year when the Brazilian working group were at the stage of thinking through how they wanted to use indicators in the cattle sector in, in Brazil. Um, and I'm going to run you through some of the the tools that exist with some examples. So one tool that you may have come across is, is the concept of scorecards. These are often used as a campaigning tool. It's generally a way of coming up with some simple criteria and trying to assign a score so that you can uh, allow a comparison between organizations. Um, it's could be a way of trying to praise the best performers. It could be a way of trying to shame the worst. Um, some examples, Oxfam have a behind the brands uh, scorecard, which is aimed at food companies and looks at 10 companies on criteria such as women, land, climate, workers. And it's measured them over a period of um, quarters or half years over a number of years. WWF have an oil palm, a palm oil buyer's scorecard, so targeting the, the end users of, of oil palm and um, putting in the public light uh, whether they, whether WWF consider that they are delivering on a range of variables. And then more recently, this is targeting palm oil suppliers. So this is the growers. These are the people who've got plantations of oil palm, and they're being targeted by an organization called Forest Heroes, which is giving them a score um, as to whether they consider them to be responsible or irresponsible or somewhere in between. However, there are um, a lot of tools which are more about perhaps promoting, reporting, and measuring, um, turning commitment into action. You see there are a whole load of logos, and there are a huge number of initiatives, schemes, um, in sets of indicators or organizations promoting and supporting sustainability in the agricultural commodity sector. This is just a tiny snapshot. Um, we kind of came up with five categories of ways that people are using sets of indicators and criteria. I'm going to run you through those now with some examples, which, again, I think is probably relevant to the discussion in, in livestock right now. So one is good practice guidelines. We, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that although we want to measure, we want to benchmark, we want to compare, really at the heart of people's development of indicators, principles, and criteria is often the desire to describe what good practice looks like. And even though schemes might end up using um, a set of principles and criteria for something else, um, using them as, as guidelines is an important um, element of what they're trying to do. There's an organization called the Ethical Trading Initiative, which is a generic 
um, which is an organization that works on labor practices, they created something called the ETI base code, um, which is a generic code of, of labor practice. And it's become an internationally recognized model code that people refer to and, and use to, to help them guide them through the, the minefield of what's appropriate in, in labor standards. ETI, I should mention, also have a, a sort of self-reporting system as well. With regard to what we call communication and, and disclosure, here we're referring about to when a tool is created with the intention to increase transparency, um, to disclose information uh, either to the public or to a particular set of stakeholders. And it's very much um, done in a voluntary and conscious way. Unlike scorecards, which your participation might actually be involuntary. You, you don't know you're in it until you've seen your name come up in the scorecard. These kind of initiatives, it's very much, uh, you've, you've signed up, you're, you're a member to something, and you willingly share data with a view to uh, seeing how you compare with other people and perhaps getting some positive, um, sorry, some positive feedback from that. So the Carbon Disclosure Project is, is one example um, where organizations, companies, voluntarily share information on forests, uh, climate change, and it's actually used by a group of investors who are also members of the CDP. Um, and there's a summary report which praises very much the best performers. So it's about trying to be in the best um, sector and, and get some visibility through that. The three other ways, there's a lot of overlap between these, but these are just categories that we created are all ways in which some level of assessment or gauging performance can be achieved. So we've, I keep hearing people use different things. I think they're all part of the same family. We're talking about KPIs. We're talking about outcome indicators, outcomes indicators, measurable elements. An important way they're used is, is self-assessment, and I think that can be forgotten sometimes as a really useful way of, um, of using a set of indicators. So some of you in the room may, may work with or may know the work of Solidaridad, which has a really interesting program called Horizonte Rural, where they've designed a, a, a self-assessment tool for farmers in different commodities to measure their own progress um, against a number of indicators. And there's an option to upload that and, and uh, it goes into a generic data pool and you can see how you're doing compared to other people. But its main focus is on self-learning by the producer. In terms of uh, the second group, which is what we call performance assessment by a related organization, you might have heard it called second party auditing. It's where the organization that assesses um, a, a producer or a company has some relationship to that company. So they may be their buyers um, or they may have a commercial relationship. And I've mentioned the Better Cotton Initiative here. They're a really interesting scheme that includes an element of second party evaluation. They have what they call implementing partners in different cotton producing countries that might be an NGO um, or it might be um, a producer association who is responsible for providing technical support to a group of cotton farmers. But they also do uh, progress assessments and evaluations about how they're progressing against the BCI criteria. Uh, BCI also use self-assessment and independent verification. And in a minute, I'll talk a little bit more about what Nestle are doing with responsible sourcing guidelines because we've been helping them in a couple of their commodities with that. And then finally, independent verification, certification, was talked about a lot this morning, but I think it's important to show that really it's only one of many things that you can do with indicators, principles, criteria, and indicators. And in a moment, I've got some more information on what the RSPO, uh, the responsible, uh, the roundtable for sustainable palm oil has achieved with regard to its independent certification scheme. So sometimes called third-party audits. 
So here's the, the sort of three examples. I've got one on self-assessment tools, one on the second party audits, and one on the third party audits. I wanted to draw attention to what the GTPS has been doing, because I think it's really innovative, and it fits reasonably well under the heading of self-assessment tools. You've, you will hear more about them tomorrow, and you already know it's a multi-stakeholder membership organization. Proforest has been accompanying GTPS in their journey of developing principles, criteria, and indicators. And I think what's really fascinating for people to see is the way that they've chosen to introduce stepwise indicators. So they are going for this continuous improvement model, and they've actually built in stepwise indicators, or are building in, because it's happening as we speak. Um, and in terms of this self-assessment concept, they're initially really saying this is, a, this is a tool for our members to use. It'll be m mandatory to report, but that's not going to be in the public domain. It's mainly about uh, the di disclosure of that information will be entirely voluntary, but it's really mainly about people themselves being able to see where they are on this stepwise uh, ladder of indicators. And I think some of you already know, but they have criteria for the whole supply chain. So... Um, not just for producers, but there are sustainability requirements for other GTPS members, including banks and retailers. In terms of an example of how uh, indicators, criteria can be used by a, a company in the supply chain, a manufacturer, we can look at what Nestle have been doing, they are rolling out a program of responsible sourcing guidelines across 12 commodities. You can see the pictures there. They've started with some, with some of those, not all of them yet. And Proforest has been helping them in the implementation of that program for sugarcane and soy. So they've been using what you would essentially call second-party audits because organizations like ourselves or our local partners in country have been carrying out uh, field visits to sugarcane mills, to soy processing sites, and importantly to their supply base to understand how well they are meeting Nestle's responsible sourcing guidelines. And Nestle is using that to, to understand where it's at with its sustainability commitments um, throughout its supply chain, but also to see where help is needed to address any particular challenges and bottlenecks. And I think that's an interesting model to look at for companies interested in wondering how they can help. And finally, um, certification schemes. The Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil is also a multi-stakeholder organization, and it has now got a fully functioning certification scheme, so it has auditors, it has a standard for the way that palm oil should be produced in a plantation. And what I wanted to draw attention to here is that people talk about certification being niche, but, you know, 18% of the um, palm oil, global palm oil, is already certified, which is a pretty big achievement. They've only been really fully functional for about five or six years. So I, I think that certification schemes do have a role to play, but they're definitely only one part of the jigsaw puzzle. So my closing thoughts are, to, to summarize, I think we can see that there's a range of tools and um, we, we will need, continue to need a range of tools. We will not only be able to just use one size fits all. So good practice guidelines will have a role, innovative uh, um, training courses and, and changes on the ground will have a role. Self-assessment, measurement, certification, they will have a role. And you might need different tools at different phases. As Karen Kreider from ICL said this morning, there's a lot of information out there from other sectors. So there's, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, although obviously uh, whatever gets created needs to respond to the peculiarities or the particularities of uh, the sector. Well, I wanted to draw three emerging issues, kind of sort of red flags, really, that 
um, we've noticed in our work over the years that it might be helpful to have in your minds going forward. One is that I think we're starting to see that the race to make all these global commitments um, about sustainability procurement in supply chains has with it a risk that we are racing ahead with commitments where we don't really necessarily have the tools to understand how to deliver those. And I think deforestation is one of those areas where the uh, commitments that people are being, um, people are making, that sound very, uh, very meaningful and very important, but behind the scenes, uh, we are still a little bit behind in developing the tools to really understand how to apply that in different ecosystems around the world. So case in point, there's a, there's a methodology called the high, ca uh, high carbon stock methodology, which has been developed in one part of the world, um, but is being promoted as something that everybody should be adopting. And we really need the time to do more, as I've put there, more regional testing and also collaboration between different approaches about how you measure or determine zero deforestation. So I think we need to be, um, we need to be aware of that risk. The other thing I wanted to mention is audit fatigue, duplication. I've been in situations where I've seen um, a producer on the ground, an oil palm producer perhaps, or a sugarcane mill, saying that they have had requests for visits from a number of manufacturers, traders, uh, even retailers, bringing with them their own standards and their own requirements, which are extraordinarily similar, but requesting visits for audits um, throughout the production se um, season, and there's an inevitable du uh, sort of duplication of what they're asking for, and it's a huge investment of time and cost for the producer receiving these visits. My thoughts on that are, some of you may have heard of the SEDEX um, program. It, in my understanding, it grew out of a similar situation that was happening in factories around the world, particularly um, with related to labor conditions. Everyone wanted to make sure there was no child labor and no slave labor. And numerous companies, garment manufacturers and retailers were sending in audits. And so to avoid this audit fatigue, there was a platform created where you can voluntarily upload the results of one of your supplier's audits if they've bought into the scheme. And then that, that kind of uh, allows the other retailer or manufacturer to tick off a box and say, okay, we don't need to go and ask the same thing then. And I'm wondering whether in the future we might see something similar for production level verification. And finally, a topic that is close to our heart in ProForest is the exclusion of smallholders or the risk of exclusion of smallholders. What we see is as internationally very ambitious commitments are made about how to ensure responsible or sustainable procurement along a supply chain, there's a risk that the smaller producers become less attractive because they are either because they have genuine challenges to meet the requirements, or more commonly that they don't have the resources to demonstrate that they're meeting those requirements. They don't have documented procedures, for example. And so there's a real risk that the rise of commitments about sustainability and creation of KPIs and benchmarks could exclude smallholders. So our suggestions would be involve them from the start. Don't end up with a scheme where you then have to say, uh, actually, we, we kind of aimed it more at the bigger producers with the bigger impacts, and now we need a sort of add-on for smallholders. Um, think about regional or risk-based approaches. So can you have some regional data, satellite data, or information that means you don't have to gather data at the level of every smallholder? And think about involving the, the next level in the supply chain, maybe the slaughterhouses, maybe the sort of gathering points the fattening farms, of using those points to help, help provide tools for the smallholders to implement sustainability um, according to the things that, that you're interested in. And we're part of an initiative called SHARP, which is, um, the acronym was about smallholder acceleration and um, REDD, so climate change related. But it's an initiative that's looking at how to help smallholders get increased yields and have a reduced impact on agricultural expansion 
um, and become part of responsible and sustainable supply chains. Um, and that's been focusing a lot at the moment on um, palm oil and sugarcane, but I think actually cattle and the SHARP program would be a really good fit. So I invite you to Google that name or ask me for more information about the SHARP initiative. Thank you.